Sweet. Okay, guys, thanks for coming to our past lecture. Um, uh, thank you to Reva for sponsoring us. Um, yeah, Beyonce. Um, today we have a guest speaker called um, Salasi Sutsdufi, and she's from BFA, which stands for Black Females in Architecture. And she's here to give a presentation on her career today and what it's like being a Black female architect within the industry. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Um, <laughs> so if you see me looking this way, it's because I'm trying to get up my notes, but I might not use my notes. We'll see. Um, so thanks for having me. I'm going to share my screen. Um, give me a sec. Can everyone see this? My thousand um, yep. tabs. Yep. Cool. So, um, my name is Selassie Setifa, um, as you all know. And yeah, I'm one of the co founders of Black Females in Architecture. Um, here are a, little, a few little facts about me. Um, I'm also currently Senior Architect and Innovative Sites Program Manager at B First. B First is um, Barkin and Dagenham's wholly owned no, London Borough of Barkin and Dagenham, which is a local authority in Greater London. B First is its wholly owned development company. Um, I'm also a public practice alumni. Um, I am a member of the Future Architects Architect Steering Group. I am one of the co-hosts for Open City Podcast, which is a podcast by Open City and Open House. Um, I chair the NLA. NLA stands for New London Architecture. I chair its Next Gen Sounding Board. Um, I'm also a trustee of an organization called Street Space, which is a local organization here in Barking. And I'm also a core member of a uh, creative organization called One Room. So a few, um, I guess, bits of background to myself. I guess I really wanted to approach this as um, kind of just telling my story, to be honest, um, and just talk you through what I've been doing so far and where I'm at at the moment. Um, a huge chunk of that is going to be going into a little bit more depth about what Black females in architecture is about. So this is where my architecture journey started from. Prior to this, I didn't, I didn't have any real proper in-depth understanding or exposure to architecture as a profession. Um, aside from the fact that I'm quite an inquisitive person and I've always been intrigued by space and place. Um, yeah, so I set about my architecture journey coming to Portsmouth School of Architecture when it was still in Portland Place. I believe you're now in, based in Eldon, the Eldon building. And yeah. 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 I remember, I think I vaguely remember um, when it was moving over. When I first arrived at Portsmouth, I stayed in Trafalgar Halls, I believe, which is just next door to Eldon, if I'm not, if I'm remembering correctly. But yeah, so this is where it kind of started. It was an interesting three years, very tough. And I'm sure you're experiencing that for yourselves, depending on which stage you're at or whatever stage you're at. Um, but yeah, it, it was a great experience. I made some lifelong friends and I learned a lot there. Leaving Portsmouth, however, I kind of, yeah, I found it, this was, I le without showing my age, I. I left Portsmouth in 2012 and that was sort of just post um, the financial crisis and in London it was very tricky to get a sort of entry level architectural job, part one job. I found it really tough. I took, I was planning on taking two years out and I was determined mm. to take two years out to kind of really gain as much practical experience as possible. So I, I was adamant that I was going to do that and I did, but I couldn't really find work. So I kind of had to 
one kind of overcome this big uphill battle of kind of self-doubt and all of these other feelings and then also just try to find ways around the situation. Uh, one thing that I ended up doing was um, entering this competition uh, which was looking for sort of students um, to participate in this project, a design and build project. And this was the output of that project. It was a group of, I think, five of us. Um, it ended up us all being part ones and we were mentored by a, a small architectural practice. And we built this temporary shop um, behind, well, at the base of the Hayward Gallery, which is part of the South Bank Centre. Um, it, this was during festival season, so it was a part of um, a festival called um, the Festival of Neighbourhood. Another thing, I think it, during, after my part one, I, well, after this period, I still couldn't find work. I ended up in Slovenia for about seven months doing, a pay, doing an internship in an architectural practice there. Um, that in itself was an interesting experience as well. I don't have any pictures to show you, unfortunately, but um, yeah. It was a great experience. However, I probably, I most definitely wouldn't recommend going off and doing any unpaid internships, no matter um, the struggle at the time. Um, but yeah, that's what I did. Um, then, oh, I've missed a bit here. After that, I went to Manchester. I did my part two in Manchester. Again, a really brilliant experience, which taught me a lot and opened me up to a, a, a whole sort of, different way of thinking about architecture and really questioning what architecture meant to me and where I wanted to place myself within sort of the built environment industry, having already established that I was quite interested in wanting to be an architect and find navigating that in maybe a different way than the traditional, but I definitely did feel like I wanted to be an architect from quite early on. So completing my part two, after part two was not in the mood for the stress that kind of that I felt um, um, post part one after leaving Manchester uh, after leaving Portsmouth. So I decided to take a different approach to um, looking for work. I'm from London, East London, kind of on the cusp of Essex. Um, I'm from a background. My, well, my, my family is of Ghanaian heritage. I was born and raised in Barking. Um, and yeah, I didn't have the sort of right networks to sort of help me under, understand the architectural industry um, and give me that sort of leg up or open some doors for me. That's not the kind of background I was coming from. So I had to navigate that space for myself. So one of the things that I did um, upon coming back to London, bearing in mind, I've been to uni in Portsmouth, I've been to, I went off to Slovenia, I came back and went to uni in Manchester, hadn't really been in Barking, my home, my home sort of town and, and really explored what architecture meant in this sort of neighborhood environment that I grew up in. So I was really keen on having developed a sort of idea of um, wanting to engage in a more participatory approach to architecture, really keen to try and what, explore what that meant. Um, I ended up doing a lot of networking and met an amazing woman called Elsie Wusu, who kind of encouraged me to, yeah, really go out and explore a different approach to practicing and existing um, within the built environment and architectural space. So I ended up setting up a, my, a company um, making sure never to call myself an architect because at that point I was not an architect yet. Um, but there's a wealth of knowledge that um, you learn through architecture education and through all of the experiences that come with it that are definitely not to be looked down on and could, could, could contribute in a, a number of different ways to a professional or a career of, of any kind. I guess it's really up to you to define that. And I feel like one of the, the, the negatives of architectural school as, as it was when I was in architectural school, and I don't know if it still is, I hope it's not, is that I was really made to feel like being an architect was the only sort of aim and the only goal. And there wasn't, there wasn't much scope to explore for myself and um, 
what me existing in architecture could look like. Um, anyway, I set up this architectural pra this, this practice and I used it as a, a tool to explore different ways of existing in architecture, did a load of different things. Um, did this renovation project um, under the supervision of Elsie Wusu, and it became the project I used as my case study um, to complete my part three. In the meantime, through all of that networking, I met um, the lovely ladies I co-founded BFA with, and I'll speak extensively about BFA after that. Um, after working on with Elsie Wusu for about two and a half years, I then um, applied to join this program, Public Practice. Public practice. So Public Practice is an organization that is it's a self social enterprise and its aim is to, is to get more um, built environment professionals working in local authorities. So yeah, I applied and I was successful, um, which meant that I was going to get placed in a local authority. Um, and I was really keen to get placed in Barking, Barking and Dagenham, because there's such massive regeneration going on and development going on in this area. And it's changed so much since I was growing up here as a young girl. And I really felt that being in the public sector and, you know, so many things were aligning. Be first, being in existence, be first, that like I spoke about before, um, which is the council's... Um, own development company means that the council is clienting that work out so be first acts as the developer right so they get architects on board to design the different um master plans and different buildings and and such and then bring it forward through be first so that that situation felt like a a, a good place to be and you know as i know i was blessed enough to to be able to get a place in Barking and Dagnum, um, which meant that work is a 20 minute walk for me and I can, I can really get stuck in, in sort of helping to shape the place and space um, which I grew up in. Um, and yeah, that fills me with a lot of joy, I must say. Um, so a, a second thing that comes out of public practice is, is this sort of research and development element which was great because it meant that in each in each sort of they host like um, cohorts every I think biannually. So every six months there's a new cohort of people in my cohort that was about thirty of us, and it's thirty people placed in different local authorities or in, um, local institutions, which meant that you're you're bringing together a, a wealth of knowledge and a space to share a lot of knowledge of what's going on elsewhere and an opportunity to learn from each other and take that work forward. And then there's sort of um, um, research developed as part of that, which is sort of used as a toolkit to help inform um, development across across London and, and also in ever expanding to other um, areas of the country. Um, so I, my role with, within Be First was um, coming in to uh, help establish and manage a small sites program um, and that really looks like something like this. Um, this isn't uh, one of our projects but I put this in as an example because um, I'm only well I'm just over a year into my role here so we don't have outputs quite yet um, but we're slowly getting there but this is like an example of the kinds of things that um, I'm helping to facilitate coming forward most of the, the development that's coming through um, the main Be First program um, being funded by the council are sort of medium to very large scale estate renewal and, and massive um, industry intensification, industrial intensification projects. Um, so, but my role is really to, to, to look for innovative solutions to bring in forward some of these really tricky small sites. So this one as an example is a, project by Archeo and it's looking to develop that little garage site there in, in sort of the, that info land. And that's the kind of thing I'm helping to facilitate in Bark and Dagenham. Um, this is another example by an, uh, an architectural practice called KAA. Um, and another example here by um, a small developer called Naked House and it's designed by um, um, OMMX 
and again you can just about see in there how that sits this is a garage site as well sits behind um these the ends of these um garden spaces of these terrace houses so that's what i've been doing at b first and my placement was up in last october and since then i have now joined the wider design team and i'm helping um work towards some of the, the larger scale projects as well as the smaller scale ones, which is exciting. So on to BFA stuff. Um, as I mentioned before, this kind of came about through me, um, yeah, really putting myself out there to network a lot more, to try and find a resolution to the fact that I really didn't have any sort of connections with the industry. And the fact that I soon found out that you know, a lot of a lot of life in general, above and beyond architecture, is really about who you know. Um, and ultimately, there was a lack of representation within the industry. So it's, it's almost like you have to work. You, you have to work really hard at um, getting a foot in the door. Um, so yeah, BFA exists as a network um, founded to amplify the, visi the visibility of Black. Um, women in the architectural industry and build environment fields. Um, these are a few of our members. Um, like I was saying before, we really believe in the power of networking and skill sharing, learning from collective experiences, um, both positive and negative. Um, um, so BFA is really intentional about the kind of voices and experiences of, of, of black women within the industry. Um, and we try to be all encompassing as much as we can in that I'm constantly learning and, 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 and um, revising what we mean by this, because the more we, we exist in this space, the more we, we start to understand how um, there are different sort of um, groups of people that have quite um, particular um, situations and particular um, stereotypes against them and particular kind of um, discriminatory um, situations that they need to overcome. Um, so yeah, we try to be all encompassing of those things. And we really work into support and build capacity of uh, our members um, in terms of um, you know, providing creative opportunities, providing access to jobs and work experience. Um, hosting workshops and skills training and just generally building um, confidence and well-being. Um, right, so the network sort of at the moment we've got about 350 odd members and that ranges from you know um, 16 year olds who are looking to get into the profession and um, that being architecture and other sort of fields around the built environment talking about things like interior design, planning, urban design. We have people who are members who are all in those different fields. So people as young as 16 getting in, interested in getting into the industry and people who are, have been in the industry and well established with about 30 plus years of experience. And that creates a good opportunity to, like I say, learn from each other, be mentored and have mentees and, and have reverse mentoring even in some instances. Um, and we're really looking to sort of combat um, things like racism, sexism and nepotism um, and actively working towards sort of things like decolonizing the curriculum and the profession at large. So these are sort of some key figures and stats around why we feel BFA as an organization is very necessary. Um, currently, and this is not to frighten um, people in, in, in this call, um, but just to make you aware of, of what the situation is um, coming out of sort of the educational space and going into the working world. Um, with architecture in particular, um, these are the kind of figures that you're looking at. And there's a big dip, um, sort of dip in terms of um, people entering into architectural degrees and sort of the proportion of the proportionality of what that looks like um, when we're looking at race in particular and 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 gender. Um, these are some old stats. I mean, we're four, we're four or five years on now, um, but. 
the situation has largely remained quite the same. Um, there's some kind of um, diversity coming into part one, um, passing part one, and then that kind of dips off as you go into part two, and then it sort of tails off when you get into part three. A couple of caveats here, I feel like, for me definitely, like I mentioned before, what I briefly mentioned, I struggled in architectural school for a number of different reasons, which I won't get into now. Um, could write a whole thesis about that. But I think what, I what I've come to find out through BFA and through engaging with a lot of the members is that a lot of them struggled as well for one reason or another. And those stories are quite um, relatable. And I didn't pass, I, I didn't pass in, in, in Portsmouth for first, second, first or second year. I think I had to resit both both times or resubmit. Um, and I think, yeah, and I definitely had to resubmit at least once in Manchester. Um, I guess that's neither here nor there at the time was super stressful. Um, fast forward 10 years, it's neither here nor there because I, yeah, thank God I'm still making progress through my career anyhow, sorry. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important to note and trying to make BFA as an organization is really trying to change what these figures look like. Having said that, we're also wanting to help people just be more comfortable and confident in navigating different paths through architecture. You don't have to be an architect at the end of the day and you not being an architect doesn't sort of um, um, lessen your contribution to the industry or mean less than somebody who does qualify to become an architect. I think it's a personal choice and I think the, the the more open you are, the earlier the earlier you're more open to to the different prospects. I think the better. I wish I had been more open in the beginning. Beginning it would have helped a lot. Anyway, so I'm gonna steam through because yeah, time. Um, these are the co-founders: Neba, Alicia, uh, myself, and Akia. Um, started in June 2018. Um, and this, is, this was our progression. Um, at present, like I said, we're on about 350 members, uh, steadily keeping up to four, 400. And the, this is how we started. Our genesis was a WhatsApp group with, with four of us, the four co-founders, and then it just kind of grew and spiraled out from there. And we're actively always seeking to be a better digital platform and more engaged because our members are international, essentially, from America through to Africa. Uh, these are some of our team members, um, again, from all over the UK, as well as from Africa. Noelle is based in Rwanda. Um, yeah, as a network, our primary focus is about career development and well-being of Black women in the built environment. And our main thing is to support our members as much as we can. We host a number of events, um, social events. Um, uh, we mainly hosted them before, well, before the pandemic, we mainly hosted them in London. And then we tried to venture out to Manchester, which was fun. Um, we've hosted book clubs. Um, we've been invited to attend um, an event in America alongside the, um, the New York's um, Black kind of like the, the New York's version of Reba for the black community. Um, other social events, more sort of intimate events um, to just sort of discuss and socialize with each other, particularly since um, the pandemic have included this one. Um, we've also collaborated with organiza other organizations. So this um, event was um, in partnership with um, a co-workers called Fora. We've also done really intimate stuff in, in our houses. This one here is in my living room, um, just touching on different sort of real life issues. Um, we've done events based around learning, um, organized mental, mentorships for people to um, sort of get tips and tricks of how to present their CVs and portfolios, making sure that we have um, black women to, to as, 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 as role models there to, to help guide um, young, young people coming up through the industry. I have never ever had a black tutor ever in my life, not even in primary school. 
And so I find it quite powerful to be able to connect a young black woman or even anyone in architecture uh, education with um, a black woman professor. Um, other learning events have included more events tailored more specifically to people looking to build um, businesses. Um, and we've also done a few different research projects. We started out with, with um, a, a project which looked into making um, recycled, recycled, using recycled uh, plastics to make new materials. Um, we do a lot of ad outreach and advocacy work. Um, that's a yeah. That's that's sort of our one of the things that we do on a regular, which is I guess outside of our main thing of supporting our members. And we like to create opportunities for our members to be able to get onto these platforms and have their voices and expertise sort of heard, and for them to contribute to wider discourse in the in the profession. So yeah, this we've we've, we've done a lot of this kind of stuff. And we're working towards um, getting more and more members, less of our faces. And our, when I say our, I mean the co-founders and more of the 400 different women that are part of um, our network. So yeah, these are a few different uh, anecdotes from, from some of our members. This one from Noella. Um, yeah, she's realized through, our, through her studies and work that architecture has considerable impact on everyone's everyday lives. And that's something that I've definitely realized a lot more. And that's where I guess um, my practice is really um, focused. Um, this is Umi, um, who's done a lot of work around decolonizing um, curriculum. And this is one of our members who's an urban designer Jacqueline um, yeah just as an example of the different kinds of members that we have in the different um, I guess backgrounds and fields within the built environments with that they work in um, another thing to note um, just in passing we are a voluntary organization um, everybody's got a full-time job and this is done outside of hours um, we're not funded but um, in 2020, although we didn't really raise any funds, um, we did manage to receive donations of 300, um, well, 3,000 pounds plus, um, which we then used to pay different um, people who um, go on go on speaking opportunities. Where because we, we strongly believe that everybody should be paid for their time and effort. So if we're going to present an opportunity to be a fame member, we want to make sure that they're paid for that. And yeah, I will stop there because I've definitely gone over my time. No, that's fine. That was amazing. Thank you. I think there's a question in the chat. Um, but if anyone's well, you're welcome to uh, unmute yourself and ask any questions you may have. Thank you, though, Sassy. You're welcome. I have a question. Sure. Hi, um, so you spoke about, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, I'll just start from the beginning. Sam Morgan, I'm a second year architecture student. I'm also a BAME ambassador. So I work um, for the student union and representing BAME um, voices within um, like students and then so like tapping the university and like the like, kind of outlook on that. Um, so you spoke about how um, you had to retake and um, as like black women and um, ethnic students, it's quite hard, um, you know, um, to like go through that. Um, so obviously the University of Portsmouth has a really high um, BAME attainment gap. Um, so do you think this influenced, you know, um, your kind of experience at the university or any institution for that matter? Yeah, I think in the first instance, I was super conscious of that. I feel like, We've had so many discussions with, with in BFA as well as with with other organisation, other sort of um, allied organisations that have emerged in the last sort of two to three years about this kind of this issue, which has been like an issue that has been unspoken, and it's not until you get around other people who've 
got that same shared experience that you start to really try to unpack what's going on. Um, and it's a number of different things. What it isn't is a, is a case of, of um, we're just not good enough. That definitely isn't the case. And sometimes it's made, that's definitely how you can, you can get to feeling or that's definitely how it kind of ends up being portrayed um, in the practical sense of you just not getting a job when everybody else seems to be getting a job or yeah, you knowing the level of work that you've put in and not getting the mark when you see other people not so great portfolios and they somehow you're missing something. And I think it's a big thing of, this is why I felt like the network part was a big factor because everybody's coming into it with different life experience up until the point that you enter um, architectural school that day one, I think your, your knowledge and your experience is what is what's of value. And I think the average sort of um, African Afro-Caribbean diaspora person, um, young, young adult coming in, your lived experience is really about the kind of culture that you grow up in, the kind of spaces that you move in. And that can be quite different to the typical, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, white experience, um, whether that's culturally, and that manifests spatially in my mind. Um, so when you come into that environment and you're kind of having to unlearn what you know about space and place, how to move in space and place, what space and place means, relearn somebody's uh, like a very colonial view of what that is you're you're on a back foot before you've even started talk less of the fact that people are coming in with having had you know exposure to architecture whether through family or you know different privileges that people have um i think that 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 unlearning that you have to do definitely puts you on a back foot and automatically gives you this weird complex not everybody, but a lot of the people that I've spoken to, this weird complex of, of like an imposter, imposter syndrome, even, even though everybody's at the same level, quote unquote, you already have that complex of an imposter syndrome from, from, from the gate. And that never sort of seems to fade away. Like you can, unfortunately, it, unless the system change changes. And I think people are starting to realize that. And that's why things like, decolonizing the, the, um, the, the curriculum, those type of thing, initiatives have come about. That's why sort of um, curriculums like race and space curriculum from I think the Bartlett UCL, that's why those things are coming about. But it's, it's, it's quite a systemic issue that, that is manifested in this thing of, of, of um, the disparity in, in in grades that happens, but it's, there's a bigger issue that kind of leads onto that. Um, and yeah, I would really look forward to seeing people really understand that a lot deeper and, and really work to sort of undo those systemic problems. I hope that answers your question. That was really helpful. <laughs> yeah, I've just been looking into it a lot and obviously Portsmouth's one is really high like compared to um, other uh, universities. So it's quite an interesting thing, especially um, some members of the uni have called it the black uh, taming gap as well, which is quite alarming. So there are, you know, things that can be changed. And like we have to remember it's, come, it's more of an awarding thing. So it's like comes from the institution rather than the students um, being like, made at fault. So yeah, that was a really helpful answer. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, I have, I mean, I'm not sure if it's a question, but I know you've mentioned about the systematic nature of these issues. Mm -hmm. Do you think they're more ingrained into society as a whole or the companies that are hiring? Because I would like to think that architecture is quite a progressive space and that the people are constantly progressing in form of technology, but also ideologies. Do you think it's something that's more an issue with society as a whole or it's specific companies that people are applying to? And do you think that can be resolved by new people starting companies or by a whole societal change of view? I think it's all of those things, to be honest. It's definitely a not, not a one size fits all or one solution solves everything. I think one, yes, that's part of what Elsie encouraged me to do. Setting up, setting up something so that there's more people 
in leadership positions ultimately if you if you if you think about it as right we're trying to get um sort of the old the really older generation which which where there's inherent biases and everything else sits to change their ways from however many decades that they've been existing in that manner or you're trying to get new fresh people in who have more progressive views around things like diversity and inclusion and equity and justice to step up and you know make make their way through and become those leaders who are going to bring on those more diverse um um so, so essentially support people who have these positive ideologies that we want to support and see in a future yeah. generation that's one thing that's a definite yeah. that's one thing is definitely helpful another thing is that i mean as human beings we have biases we have we have Unfortunately, we have biases. We have a lot of biases. We have a lot of privileges, and everybody has a, a privilege of some form or sort, and a bias of some form or sort. And architecture is definitely not immune to it, and it's probably one of the worst. It's kind of the opposite of what you would think, as you say. It's progressive in in thinking around, you know, technology and in, engaging in like societal and political spheres and all those kind of things. But in terms of what its workforce looks like it's lazy yeah, yeah, and it's definitely not progressive it's it 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 sits in that that status quo and it doesn't it's not it's not um hard enough on itself to, to push for that change yeah thank you <laughs> um hi Salasi. hi yeah um, I wanted to ask a question. Um, what kind of advice would you give like someone like me that's also like a black female, like one day leaving this institution and going into the actual working world to like start my part one properly? Like what kind of advice would you give to like actually like know how to network with like companies and actually getting a job and stuff? I think for one, keep an open mind. Don't pigeonhole yourself to thinking that there's only one way to do it. Um, is how many ways to skin a cat apparently? Um, <laughs> like, I think that's the worst thing I did to, to myself is, is have this very like blinders on type of approach to how I was gonna navigate um, my, my way through the profession. I think keep your options open. I think one of the best things that architecture education gives you is above and beyond, oh, can you draw? Can you use Revit? Can you use this? Can you use that? Can you articulate yourself in drawn form or whatever is, is a way of thinking. And I think that's far more powerful and more superior than any of those other more, you know, buildable skills. Um, so I think use that to your advantage and, 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 let, you, and let that take you on whatever course it's gonna take you. Um, that's one thing I think in terms of finding a job um, yeah I think the key is networking really um, that that's how that's yeah that's how sort of the privileged do it and mm -hmm. seeing as well I wasn't put in that position I had to now go out and make sure I created that network and yeah once the ball start rolling once the ball start rolling it's it's very beneficial in one way or another it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to go up to someone and say oh can I have a job it's more of you know creating that creating good and lasting relationships and then eventually those start to form into one thing or another might create an opportunity for you to start a project or initiate a project or you know open some sort of remove the scales from someone's eyes and, and allow them to see beyond their bias or whatever um, I think that's really important and but above and beyond that I think when you're within these networks a lot of opportunities get shared in that space anyway mm -hmm. you can imagine if you're in a network of 200 people and there's at least 10 15 of them constantly sharing different opportunities and they're in different spaces as well so then you're not at, you're not at the table that they're at but they can bring you some of that information and bring you some of that learning and knowledge um, yeah okay thank you thank you very much <laughs> hi can i ask a question yeah.
Um, hi. Um, uh, thanks for that, Sassy. That was really good. I just wanted to know if you've had any experience, because you mentioned that um, you do like CV workshops and mentoring. Have you had any experience of anyone like coming and saying that, I don't know, they feel like more, more discouraged when applying for jobs, say, because someone might read your name and not be able to pronounce it and then overlook you or they yeah. like to go to school mm-hmm. and overlook you. Um, I feel like I felt that I'm doing a I've done a part one I'm doing a master's apprenticeship at the moment but I feel like that was a problem and I feel like before you have experience to back yourself up in your own head do you experience people kind of feeling discouraged when they're first applying for jobs? Yeah 100% and again this was a thing that I had my own personal theory about because like I said I really struggled to find a job Um, and every job I've had has been a little bit unconventional um, up until now. Um, yeah, this is my first proper full salary job and I've got a pension and whatever else in how many years of um, since starting my architectural journey. Um, I've navigated and found ways around stuff. And part of the reason I've been able to do that is a certain level of privilege. I'm not privileged, but a certain level of privilege. Um, And the point about, yeah, I definitely felt I've not got any English names. I love my name, but no English names at all. Um, And I definitely felt that that might have been a barrier. And I remember at the time reading articles in the paper of someone, a guy sort of local to me, changing his name on his CV in order to be able to get an interview and things. And I felt like I had theories around that and it wasn't until, you know, I spoke about those more intimate events that we hold and the one that I held in my, in my living room. And one such event, a few of the women in the room, and there's only eight women in the room, about three, four of them all shared experiences of either feeling discriminated against because of their names or knowing full well that they had been discriminated against because of their name. Like for an example, a lady who is sort of francophone, um, I think she had applied for a job um, in like Switzerland or somewhere. Her name is kind of very French, so wasn't really distinguishable. She got through the interview stage online, um, um, fine in terms of uh, sending an application. I think she had a phone call and then it was supposed to be a Skype. And in the Skype meeting, it's just kind of like, oh, um, oh, hi, so you're X, Y, and Z. And from there, the conversation just turns south and it's kind of like, oh, actually, we don't think our, 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 our clients will be comfortable with some nonsense. And it was very, I don't know, it's, it's a weird thing to have to say, but it's very bittersweet hearing that story because one, it proved the theory that was unprovable before. But two, it was devastating and heartbreaking to hear that she'd had to go through that experience and that 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 scenario is actually very true. Um, So, yeah, those are the kind of things that we're trying to combat as an organization. Um, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's good that people are able to share the stories and stuff. It makes it not good, but (laughs) nice to know that you're not alone kind of thing and progress in that. Great. Thank you. Hi Selassie, um, thank you so much for this lecture, like it's been really inspiring to hear about the work you do, um, especially with black females in architecture. Um, and I was just wondering if like, um, in terms of like your journey in becoming an architect um, and also um, in the networking things you've done with other um, black females, like has informed the way that you actually design the projects you do? Um, and if you can think of any ways that it has informed the way you design architecture, um, and maybe if you thought that that can help change society um, in a sense. I think, I think it's made me more um, conscious and, and I guess given me a lot more into, uh, motivation to be able to create situations where we're designing for the places and spaces that we design are inclusive and equitable and they're designed by the kind of people that they're being designed for if that makes sense for example in london if we have you know a 30 percent um pop- diverse population i don't see why not why we don't have 30 percent 
of a working force, you know, doing these re regeneration projects in, in different sort of, providing different sort of affordable housing for people, for diverse communities only being designed by, you know, people who are not from minority backgrounds. It should, it should be a proportional split in my view. And you would often come across this argument of, oh, we just don't know where, you know, the, my, um, the diversity in architecture is. And I feel like that's a very sort of poor and lazy excuse. Um, and we need to work hard at both ends in the, in the, pre uh, in the profession, but also within the academic, academic sphere to make sure that we are producing enough and, and retaining enough talent within the industry to be able to do that. That doesn't necessarily, I guess, answer your question about design per se, but I think it is important that eventually that comes out because if, we're, if the people designing the spaces are reflecting the society they're designing for, ultimately we'll be able to create the kind of spaces that are responsive for those diverse communities. Okay, thank um, you. You're welcome. I think Roger has a question, but you're muted. I think Roger. Oh. Yep. I, I teach at Portsmouth and um, I'm old and I'm white and I come from a privileged background. And I found your talk tonight both inspiring uh, but also incredibly depressing. But it shifted on the side of the inspiring. So thank you for that. Um, at Portsmouth, we're, we're struggling with these, these issues. And, and we have a, we've initiated a group called uh, Equality, Diversity and Respect Group. Mm -hmm. And part of our mission is to try and shift ways of thinking and ways of being that actually recognize, acknowledge, and, and celebrate diversity. Mm -hmm. But it really is a struggle. And I'm sorry, my phone's going off. Um, I wonder, is there any advice that you could give us or is there any support that we could draw from you in terms of shifting a kind of archaic agenda? Mm. Because I, you know, I showed a slide to my first year histories, theories and matters of concern group a few weeks ago um, that showed the RIBA council, for example, in 1956, which was the year of my birth, populated by males of a certain age, of a certain class, of a certain way of being. And I, I wonder how much that agenda has moved on and how you could advise us to, to really shift this agenda forward because it's, it's really urgent in my view. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how your group and our group could somehow come together and help each other. Yeah, I think there's a number of ways and a number of things. So I'll start with, um, the RIBA as an institution. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult one, especially when you talk about the RIBA and the, um, the ARB as well. Yep. Um, and one thing that I felt and believe in, although I definitely don't support um, a lot of what the RIBA still ends up standing for, even if it claims otherwise, um, is that I feel like there's there's something to be said or, or, or a position to be played in getting involved and making change from the inside out. So what I didn't mention before was that I was a Reba council member, spent three years on Reba council, and I actually came in having on the back of having met Elsie Owusu and and working starting to work with her. She was on Reba council and she was the only black woman on Reba council, and had encouraged myself as well as. I think it ended up being a group of 30 of us, 30, 18 of us to, to um, apply to join Weaver Council. And that was on the sort of anniversary of the death of Stephen Lawrence. You know, Stephen Lawrence Trust has a, a relationship with the RIBA and yeah. So we did that. And I think 
ended up eight of us on council that year and that was the council's most diverse um, cohort. Um, and I guess that effort still is there to some degree. I spent my time there and through that um, contributed to setting up the Reba Future Architects. But it was very eye-opening to see because a lot of what you say is still true, unfortunately. Um, there's still a lot of inherent biases there. Um, and some of these things just require real sort of uprooting and fundamental change. And if, for example, the RABA as an institution still holds a constitution that is from 18 whenever, it's not too hard to see why some of these changes, just as much as, as, much as they try, just can never really do what they need to do. That's one thing. Um, on the second thing of how we can work together, we can definitely talk about that um, and different ways to work together. Um, on the thing around um, the issue of, of um, the attainment gap, I think that comes down to, again, a need to fundamentally question, look and pick apart the curriculum to, to really question what architecture is, because it has come to be that architecture by definition is a, a Western construct almost. And yeah. it's governed by thinking that the ones, the people that we look to as, as, as prominent figures in architecture and people who've, who've um, contributed to what architect, we believe architecture to be today are like the Le Corbusier's and the Mies van der Rohe's and who, the whoever's from, you know, from, from way back when and the, the, all of the Italians and, and whatever else. And that in this global society right now just doesn't cut it. And it can never, it can never be that you're going to have a diverse cohort of students that you're trying to, like I said, with their own inherent um, lived experience of place and space that you're trying to mold and shape and force into this box of accepting and delivering an architecture that is a Mies and a Le Corbusier-esque type thing. Those things are just like oil and water. And if that's what you're trying to force the, the sort of teaching to be a, about, then ultimately you're going to have that attainment gap. There's going to be a few that come through and are able to, 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 to grasp that and, and move and, and, and sort of assimilate really and deliver that. But there's going to be a heck of a lot of people that 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 just doesn't work for. Um, Thank you. I mean, what's what's been really interesting in in lockdown is is it's given us a chance maybe to reflect a lot. And one thing I'm seeing, and I think a lot of colleagues are seeing, is that when students are returned to their own cultural conditions those cultural conditions are actually manifesting themselves within their design work. Mm -hmm. And that's led me to reflect upon how much we are compressing those young minds mm -hmm. in terms of transporting them to a, a kind of UK cultural construct, which um, I'm increasingly thinking is impositional rather than enabling. I think I totally agree. I think you're definitely right. I think, yeah, it's about it's about that. Like I said, the most important lesson that I learned from architecture school is 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 a way of thinking. But yeah, you're definitely stifling your cohort of students by imposing a way of thinking rather than nurturing a way of thinking that can be applied to X, Y, and Z situation. Um, I I think that's again a systemic issue. It's what what is what is the content of your course. And is there room enough there for people to explore their passions? What, what, what's important, important for them? I think I enjoyed my time at, sorry to say Manchester in terms of the projects I did the most because I was asked what, what go off and go and figure out what you want to do to, to base your, your thesis project on. And I think at that time in that year, we had reached uh, 7 billion people in the population and that led me on to all sorts of thinking around 
what's important in terms of um, habitat for human beings. And I definitely related that more to my Ghanaian heritage than I did to the yeah. UK context. And yeah. I think that enabled and, and gave me a passion that I wouldn't have had if I was just to have, because architecture school is a place for you to explore beyond the sort of confines of everyday rea realities, although it's good to bring that element in. Um, yeah, I think I was the most passionate about any project when I was allowed that space to do that. Thank you. Um, hi, just to specifically also answer Roger's question um, in regards to like closely like within the um, architecture school of Portsmouth and um, the BAME ambassadors um, like uh, specific to the architecture school and um, we'd like I know you mentioned a group Roger we'd, we'd like to talk to you guys about that kind of like kind of improvements and um, uh, things that could benefit um, the school of architecture at Portsmouth and like the whole um, curriculum in general to be honest. Great, Morgan, that's fantastic. I've, I've got a conversation with Daniel on Tuesday and maybe you could join that. Would that be okay? Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Well, Beyonce has my email address, so don't all email at once, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can share that. I can share that with you guys if you want to get in contact. That would be great, lessons. Beyonce. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Right. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming and speaking. It was amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Really. Thank you for inspiring us. Mm -hmm. thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. I'm very inspired. Thank you so much. Thank you. thank you very much, Salasi. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. And I'm glad to hear some thoughts from your perspective. Yeah. But I was beyond to say that got in, came up with the idea of contacting you. So yeah. thanks to her for, for sort of <laughs> initiating that. It's been yeah. great. No worries. <laughs> I look forward to more conversations. Yeah. So do we.